Blurbs, the Culture Industry, and the Uses of Literature. This is my final lecture to you as part of our course together. It will take you to the frontier of a crucial question in the humanities, and it will give you a sense of what the ideas and methods of humanities analytics can do to help answer it. That question, of course, is the question of the uses of literature, a phrase I take from the title of a recent book by Rita Felsky, fantastic book, uh, that informs a lot of some of the ideas that you'll see in uh, the next hour. The question of the uses of literature is a big one. We won't answer all of it. Uh, you might think of this lecture as a tease or provocation to spur you to original work of your own. So, uh, in contrast to previous lectures, we'll be working at two levels simultaneously. You might think of this as a hybrid lecture. We'll be looking at both books and texts, right? Uh, but also we'll be looking at the people who read them, or as our title suggests, at the people who use books. We'll be looking at patterns of words, in other words. We'll be looking, in fact, at the patterns of the words not in the books, but on the backs of books, those blurbs. But we'll also be looking at the patterns of uh, the patterns within people, patterns you might say of desire and patterns of need. In both cases, we'll be building, of course, quantitative models and looking at statistical patterns to extract them. Uh, when we talk, however, and let me speak broadly, when we talk about the uses of literature, we're immediately on some very interesting ground because words like literature, certainly, uh, reading, but even books are heavily loaded terms in nearly every literate culture I'm aware of. There's a notion that you know, not only are books books, but they have some special role to play in life. Certainly in Western societies touched by the Protestant Reformation, where reading and mass literacy are connected to religious virtue, even to godliness, through the reading of the Christian Bible. Right? The reason that mass literacy had the power, had the urgency, the political urgency that it did, at least in the 19th century, was that it was considered part of bringing the population closer to God through the reading of one particular book and through the good reading, the, the correct and careful reading of a single text, the, the Holy Bible, the New and Old Testament, uh, in a person's vernacular. Uh, that said, there's that same reverence or like the same sort of equivalent reverence for books that you can find uh, well beyond, let's say, the purely um, popular Christian Reformation tradition. So here's uh, Harold Bloom, a great critic recently gone from us. Uh, in his final, uh, the final book he wrote uh, called Take Arms Against a Sea of Troubles, a wonderful book. Uh, this is on the opening pages. Uh, Bloom writes, reading helps in staying alive. Returning to Dante or Milton will not prolong my existence by a single minute, but if life is to be more than breathing, it needs enhancement by knowledge or by the kind of love that is a form of knowledge. And for Bloom, of course, that knowledge or even that love is transmitted to one through uh, the act of reading itself. Um, here's another uh, uh, person with, let's say, a similarly kind of normative, exalted view of reading. This is the, the great queer director, John Waters. This, this quote goes viral on the internet every now and again. Uh, we need to make books cool again. If you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. So uh, actually, this turns out to be from a letter uh, that John Waters wrote, or at least the internet tells me it's from a letter that John Waters wrote. Um, and let me just read the next few sentences uh, we need to make books cool again. If you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. Don't let them explore you until they've explored the secret universes of books. Don't let them connect with you until they've walked between the lines on the page. So both Boom and Waters, in their, in their different and distinct ways, are presenting a view of literature as something fundamentally distinct from other practices. So for Bloom, literature is something equivalent to a form of immortality. Uh, for Waters, reading or reading well, uh, the kind of reading that books make possible, um, is a form of almost erotic intimacy. In both cases, there's a peculiar and specific uh, talent, a specific power unlocked by books and that one is morally, socially obligated to discover. Um, the problem with viewing literature that way, and I mean, this is, this is uh, certainly something that may be deeply familiar to you, but if we view literature only through this normative lens, uh, we have a problem. 
Because what do we do with the vast acres of printed paper that are churned out each year by what you might call the culture industry, right? So even a mind as open as John Waters would struggle to assert that all of the objects, you know, would accomplish, all these book objects would accomplish the high task of, in his case, erotic imagination and eros not here not the pornographic eros but some kind of soul touching event so um you know for example like i'm not sure that you know waters would say sleep with somebody simply because they had the da vinci code on their bookshelf right it, the the sort of vast quantity of pulp thrillers turned down uh the self-help books books like who moved my cheese all these will come up in our data set in in a few moments uh books uh you might think of as genre books so the uh the harlequin romance novel the trashy science fiction uh the books you might generously call humor books right if we only view uh reading literature, if we only view these, these objects as uh, sources of theological, <laughs> theological value, if we view them as art for art's sake, we're missing something about what books do for people. So uh, I want to take a slightly different perspective on this, not to ask, say, you know, how, why, you know, books, why are they so great, but to take a more open perspective. And uh, this, uh, I might find myself somewhat more in sympathy, or this talk at least finds itself more in sympathy with um, a wonderful review that the feminist critic and author Rachel Cusk wrote of Eat, Pray, Love, a book by a woman called Elizabeth Gilbert, later made into a Julia Roberts movie, right, America's Sweetheart. Um, Eat, Pray, Love is, would fall, I think, in this same category. It's not, for many reasons, it's not going to get you laid by John Waters. Cusk, in her review she writes for The Guardian, um, you know, has, does sort of the obvious thing. Say, Look, this, there's a lot of really, this book is actually pretty trashy. But um, she also asks a really interesting question, which is, what is the use that uh, the women, and she focuses in particular on women who read this book, what is this book doing? Um, and, you know, in investigating the book as, you know, in acknowledging on the one hand that this is not a great work of literature, that this book is a failure along any axis that you might consider a, a, a great book to, to, to measure across, uh, she also says the following, you know, what, do, what does Gilbert's large, mostly female readership recognize in this rather tortuous, idiosyncratic, and frankly fantastical story? Like, you know, she's holding back, I think, here. Uh, there are several possibilities, and so now Cus goes on to ask. Uh, one is that they venerate her. It's a little condescending. One is they venerate her, Gilbert, for reintroducing the idea of the pleasure principle in to female experience. So I want to ask, I'm going to take a more cusk like as opposed to Bloom-like or Waters-like perspective on this vast quantity of books that we are tempted to call um, sort of sub-literary, we might call pulp, we might, and when I've described this project to friends, they often use the word trash. Uh, what do we do with the, the books that are churned out that are not, that don't make, let's say, canonicity in some, in some way? Um, you might put it another way, if people aren't using books to understand the nature of death, if they aren't using books to achieve this, you know, uh, erotic intimacy, what are they using books for? Now, one answer you can give is that they're trying to use books like Eat, Pray, Love to understand, uh, you know, the nature of death, um, and they're failing because these books are kind of crappy. But the goal of this lecture is to understand these choices without overlapping a normative frame. And in particular, we're going to look at this question by looking at books not through this, this bloom and water sense, more through this cusp sense, and we're going to look at them fundamentally it's just like stuff, objects, in the world, physical things, you know, book like so and so, you know, they weigh so much, so and so high, so and so heavy, and we're going to ask uh, about their existence as material objects. Look at how they circulate in the world. Uh, that investigation is actually going to take us, it turns out, into some very surprising places. And among other things, it's going to complicate our notion of trash. So as we see, people can use a Dante, even. People can use great literature in, his, in the same way or in the same sense or in the same pattern as they might, for example, use a romance novel. So uh, we're going to do this. We're going to undertake this investigation. 
um, through a kind of unique and one of these wonderful early um, internet era data sets drawn from the website bookcrossing.com. So uh, Book Crossing, it's a website that emerged in the early 2000s, and uh, it's the flourishing of a certain kind of you know, early 2000s sociality, internet sociality, that mixed the virtual and the real. You might think of it as an early form of augmented reality. So uh, the reality that Book Crossing augments is uh, the book exchange self that you might see in a cafe or a hotel or a youth hostel, right? Um, this is an image uh, from Krakow, Poland, from a from a, a college dormitory, I think, in Krakow, Poland. Here's um, another book crossing, book exchange shelf. Uh, this is from a cafe in Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. Um, these are these uh, places, right? You you know you kind of leave books there for other people to pick up and and take along uh, for themselves. So um, what happens, what does book crossing do to these, uh, these book exchange shelves, you know, the, the, the stack of books that people have left behind um, you know, uh, in, the, in the cafe or the youth hostel? What does book crossing do? Well, so if you join book crossing, and joining book crossing just means giving them your email and choosing your username, what you can do is now register books. So you, you, you take your book you want to give away, you want to leave behind. Um, and you can now register that book so you get the what's called the ISBN, this universal um, uh, book identifier number that's sitting on the back. It's usually under the barcode. You can type that in to Book Crossing and say, I'm going to give, I guess this is my copy of Robert Donington's uh, Wagner's Ring and its symbols, right? So um, you, you would type the, the book's ISBN, that number, into the system. And you say, look, I have a copy of this and I'm going to pass this book along. You register that book, you're given a special code, a code that's unique to that book and to you. Uh, you write that code in the flyleaf, just you know, in the front cover of the book, um, and you leave it somewhere. You leave it in the cafe, you leave it at the bus stop, um, you leave it you know, on, the, on the table in, in the Walmart, wherever. Um, then, having done this, hopefully, uh, the person who picks up that book uh, can then type in the code and, you know, they take the book, they maybe look at it, they read it, they get interested by this. They type in the code on the inside of the flyleaf uh, into the bookcrossing.com website and that will let you know, hey, you know, I found this, that's lovely, you know, thanks for the book, Here, here's, you know, here's what I thought about it perhaps. Um, so this is partly a game, the book crossing site itself is, is kind of a game. Uh, it's a, kind of a fun catch and release uh, for, you know, the, I think the enticement here, you know, why would you do this? Sort of, you can sort of track how your book travels, you have some way to share this experience. Um, it will not surprise you, uh, perhaps, to learn that most books that are released in this fashion, they call this releasing, most books that are released uh, by people who've registered on them on Book Crossing are never actually caught. Um, actually, it turns out, so I, I, um, I'll tell you what the data set is in a moment. I actually, I had totally forgotten this. 15 years ago, I also had an account on bookcrossing.com. It turns out I released a few books into the wild uh, as while well I was traveling. Uh, nobody picked up my books, and yet, of course, I turns out I'm in my own data set now. Um, the fact, however, that most of these releases were, let's say, disappointments, the, the, the person who released them, uh, the book was never then later um, tracked and sort of registered as collected or read by somebody else. That's actually okay. Uh, we're not interested, we're less interested, let's say, in the catch part and much more interested in the release part. Because by looking at the patterns in the books that people release, both, and I'll say both the patterns in the books and the patterns of choices that people make, we're going to learn uh, a lot about how people use books, and in particular, how they use books, let's say, of a particular kind. The Book Crossing data set tells us about books, let's say, that are on the one hand valued enough by the person to be tagged and cataloged, right? So these are not books that people are simply saying, I simply get dump them, like I have too many books in my house, I'm just gonna dump them on the street or dump them, you know, I, I somehow have too much reverence, I can't really throw away a book, but I'll leave them somewhere. The person values the book enough to tag and catalog them, but at the same time, that book the owner values is now essentially being discarded. Uh, it's being cast out into the world in some way that the book is sort of used up that it can be given away to strangers without 
you know, the world's greatest hope that they'll ever hear anything back from it. So how do we understand what people are doing when they go on book crossing? Um, one way uh, to see this is just it's a fundamentally altruistic act. So people are sacrificing that they have books they love, and but you know they they uh, you know being humans, they're naturally altruistic animals, right? They want to sort of give these books away, and you know, they want to sacrifice their possession of this book to give them away. That's I think one way they might think that's the altruistic interpretation of book crossing. Um, I think that's not quite right. Um, I think a better way to look at what's going on when people participate in this site is that they're treating these books, they're understanding these books as experience machines. They're books that are consumed in the way we might consume a television show or a Netflix series. Uh, only, let's say, you know, you go on Netflix, you, you know, kind of watch, or, well, you watch the what, Queen's Gambit or something, right? Um, you don't have the urge to buy the DVD. You don't have the urge to preserve this object, you know, in your house to, you know, make sure you can always go back to it. You've enjoyed it. You valued it. Um, you've you've taken from it what you will, and now it's time for somebody else, in this case, to have it. In the case of this book, you own it, but it's not really much use to you, and you're happy now to spread it along. Um, the uh, books, in other words, the way people are using books, at least the view of the book use we're getting here, is not, these are not books like Bloom's Milton or Dante. These are not books that people are desiring to return to. These books are being cast out, uh, nor are they sort of social objects. They're not on display. You're not showing them off for, you know, a future mate, right? Um, you're doing something else with them. They're books that are passing through you as part of, let's say, the material output of the culture industry. Um, the analogy of, of uh, what people are doing on book wrestling, I still don't quite know what's going on, obviously. There's a lot of complexity in here. This is the intersection, of course, of internet culture, of book culture, material objects, virtual experiences. Uh, in some ways, people are trading a material object for the hope of a virtual connection to somebody else. Very quickly, I think you learn on Book Crossing that your books don't really get picked up, except in particularly exceptional circumstances. Um, the, the analogy to the Netflix case, it's, I think it's misleading. It assimilates many different forms of uses into a single model, this, this notion of entertainment provided by a, let's say, heavily plotted tele uh, television show. That's not the only thing that's going on. We'll see. There's actually quite a bit more. Um, but for what it's worth, Book Crossing is going to be our source of um, data, behavioral data, on how people are using literature. Um, I use this phrase, the culture industry, so what I'll do now is present to you a sort of toy model, a way to look at the materiality of books, where these books come from, and how they intersect with the individual reader. So our primary sort of dichotomy here is between the reader, in this case a participant on book crossing, uh, and the publishing industry. So uh, the publishing industry in some sense you know, it creates books, right? It, it puts them out there in the world to be purchased, whether that's purchased at the supermarket checkout, at the Walmart, at the, you know, the remainder table at the Strand, right? Um, the publishing industry creates these objects and the individual reader uh, chooses them. Now, the word choice is a complicated word. Whatever the reader's doing uh, in selecting from these books, um, in making the uh, the choice to purchase one versus the other, this these uh, behaviors are driven on the one hand, let's say, by psychological needs. And of course, for someone like Rita Felsky, uh, for someone like Rachel Cusk, the psychological needs are are crucial, right? The for Cusk, the the uh, reader who purchases and consumes Eat, Pray, Love is doing so in part because of, and she uses this Freudian phrase, the the uh, pleasure principle of female experience. At the same time, and Cusk indeed even points this out, um, it's not just, of course, the the psychological need of the reader, but the psychological read, uh, need of the reader as constructed by or driven by or influenced or at least channeled and guided, canalized by the reader's social position, their life as a person in uh, the modern industrialized world. Um, a third complexity to the act of the reader choosing to possess a book uh, revealing their possession of the book on Book Crossing by, in fact, giving it away, is the extent to which that individual reader's understanding of the spectrum of choices they have is co-created 
by their membership in some either imagined or even actual community of other readers. And so in the case of Book Crossing, part of that reader's community, of course, is other people on the website. But that might also include um, communities that exist for that reader out in the real world. So that's on the individual reader's side. And of course, the publishing industry is as a, you know, capitalist institution, it's attempting to model this, right? So by the industry is in part uh, doing market research, trying to understand the desires or the needs that the individual reader has um, in order, to, of course, to produce more of the object that is selling so well, right? So the industry is, of course, you know, spending a great deal of time trying to figure out exactly what's happening at the intersection of a reader's psychology uh, their larger socioeconomic position, uh, you know, whether they're married, how rich they are, their experiences in life, their desires to, to vicariously experience things. And then finally, of course, their membership in the community of people who recommend books to them and share books with them. Um, that said, having said the publishing industry is a capitalist uh, organization, or you know, a capitalist collective, I think it's also vital to understand that um, industries are only partly money-making uh, agencies. A publishing industry is also fundamentally just as much, if not more so, driven by the psychology and the sociality of the people who make it up. Publishers are not simply optimizing for profits. They have other tasks and other goals in mind as well. There are books that at different times the publishers will not print. There are books that their, um, uh, their staff will not consent to publish. There are books their staff want to publish. There are books they don't want to publish. So um, I think rather than saying, oh, there's this reader that's being supplied by this pure you know, profit-optimizing system, is I think that's a, that's a very naive model. We should really understand the industry itself as an ideological agent whose goals include not just selling lots of books, but selling lots of books of a particular kind. So here's our, this is a classic image that would show up in, uh, you know, images like these show up all the time at places like the Santa Fe Institute, where we understand a complex system as a structure of multiple intersecting feedback loops, feedbacks between the individual as a pure subject, reading, having desires internal to themselves, uh, having desires that are channeled and co-constructed by their social lives, and of course interacting with other in, uh, other agents and other uh, institutions that are attempting to model them reciprocally. Um, the project, sort of the the goal of this talk, is to examine this particular nexus here: the intersection between the choices that the individual reader makes and the marketing that the publishing industry undertakes in turn to influence or at least construct those choices. So if we have a research question, and David and I have been urging uh, uh, you as you undertake in, uh, your studies in humanities analytics to formulate research questions, here is at least a, a first pass. Uh, we want to know what's the relationship between the choices of the reader, the choices the reader makes, or the patterns of choices that the reader makes, and the marketing undertaken by what we might call the culture industry, the publishing industry in this case, the people who, who create and structure, manufacture, have written and printed books that are then selected by the individual reader. So that's our research question. Let's now talk a little bit about the book crossing data sets themselves. So uh, we have two, um, uh, two sources that we, that we are going to use here. These are both created back. Actually, they're now many years old. They're 15 years old. Um, the first is the data set of the users. So, um, and we'll give you the links in the, um, uh, in the, on the website themselves. We have a database uh, of scraped information from Book Crossing of users. We have about 100,000 users. And for each of those users, we have a list of the books that they have released or picked up in the wild. And the majority of these records, the majority of books on Book Crossing, are never actually ever picked up. They're only just released. Uh, we have about 100,000 users, so actually an enormous population there, larger than the entire town of Santa Fe. Um, we also have, so this is on the reader choice side, we are able to look at the kinds of books that readers possess and want to circulate further. The books that we claim are serving, have served their users as experienced machines that are now being passed on. Um, 
On the other side of the equation, on the textual side, we also have a separate data set gathered to match this one of the books themselves, and in particular the blurbs that appear on the backs of about 57,000 books that are also found in the same book crossing data set. So um, this enables us, this, this is giving us um, two pieces here. Um, we get on the one hand the, uh, the reader choice side. We have data on the kinds of books that readers possess and choose to give away. And then we have information on the industry side. We have in particular the text, not of the book itself. I mean, that would be a fascinating thing to do. We just happen to have the text on the back, the blurb uh, that is written in, uh, to sort of inform the reader of the kind of book they can expect to get if they, if they read, you know, if they actually were to purchase it or to pick it up. So um, we're going to examine this question. We have this red side. We have the individual choice side. We have the blue side. We have the industry marketing side. Let's take a look at the uh, left-hand side. This is the first goal of our investigation. What we're going to ask in particular, we're going to try to examine the types of choices readers make. And again, the choices that these readers make we don't have their credit card details. We don't know which books they bought. But we do have, from Book Crossing, the a knowledge of the books they at least possess and want to give away. So these are the types of choices readers make. Uh, one way to look at this is, as uh, you might think of them, as a taxonomy of desires. The, uh, the patterns of choices that readers make are giving us clues to the kinds of needs they have. This is sort of underlying uh, Kusk's uh, attempt to interpret what on earth is going on, like Kusk's problem, why would anybody read such a terrible book like E. Pray Love? Well, you know, this is, this is you know, Kusk is making an attempt to understand the kinds of fulfilled desires that the publishing industry is satisfying. Um, I like to think of this as, uh, you might think of this as a palette of needs supplied. So we're going to look at the, the first uh, part of this talk is going to look at the, uh, try to uh, understand in a computational fashion the types of choices readers, the types of choices readers make. So um, one way into this, imagine, for example, um, you know, you're, um, uh, you're trying to figure out what kinds of readers there are. And let's say you have, okay, you're, you know, you work at the indie bookstore and you know the kinds of books people buy. I uh, say, okay, look, you know, person one, okay, they like books A, B, and C. Uh, person two likes books C, D, and E. Uh, person three likes books A, D, and Q. So what would you do with this information? Well, one thing you might say is, well, look, you know, um, person one likes A, B, and C. Person two likes C, D, and E. So, you know, maybe there are things that are shared, not just between A, B, and C. We know in some sense there's something that, those that hangs together for those books if only because person one likes all of them, but also that there might be connections between uh, books A and E. So in the bookstore, it's like, oh, you know, you like uh, you like books A, B, and C. Huh? Well, the bookseller might say, uh, well, you know, another customer came in and, and they really liked books. They liked C like you, and they also like books D and E. So maybe, and this is not be an unnatural thing to say, maybe, um, you know, the book D might be something that would satisfy you as well. Um, even further yet, notice that, you know, we have person three, they like books A, D, and Q. So even at second order, you might say, you know, maybe there's something, there's some need in common, not just between books A and E uh, that have books C, yeah, book C in common among these ones of person one and two, but maybe there's some need common between books E and Q, right? So this is a slightly higher order thing. Um, a person who likes book E also, at least one of them, also likes book C. Uh, a person who likes book C also likes book A. Uh, a person who likes book A also likes book Q. So now maybe like E and Q, even though in fact there's no overlapping pair, maybe there's something there as well. So there's signals here, potentially, signals in the desires, the overlapping or even second order overlapping desires. Um, another thing you might say is like, look, here's person four, right? Person four likes books H, J, and K. Person five likes books, you know, E, F, and G. And now you might also say, well, you know, it seems to me that person one and person five, even though they have no likes in common that we know of, person one and person five may be similar in some social, uh, communal, psychological fashion. They might be closer to each other than person four, right? So these are two intuitions here 
that you might have when you think about trying to extract an underlying network or set of needs that people have, right? If we want to understand the uses that people are making of literature, you might think, ah, well, the kind of use that somebody makes of E uh, may be similar, at least in some way. There is some sense that this might, you have a clue, that the use made of book E might be similar to the use made of book Q, if only because in some uh, some sort of maybe second order fashion, uh, people like them, uh, or people who like one like books that are liked by others. Um, a similar kind of intuition, person one here and person five may have similar hidden needs. Of course, now they're extraordinarily implicit. They have no books in common, but there might be something in the structure of books that is enabling you to find similarities between one and five that are outweigh similarities between one and four. So um, there's no mathematical algorithm yet that I've shown you. I'm driving the intuition that we may learn about what's inside a person by looking at the patterns, at the population level patterns of the books that people like. So um, the, there are challenges here. Um, one of the main challenges we find is what we might think of as the long tail of needs. When we're looking at the choice patterns that people make, excuse me, we look at the choice patterns that people are making, we have in fact the final tally in our data set from the user side. We have data on 105,283 users. And we have in the end, after we clean out some of the, uh, the, the ISBNs that don't match, we have 48,584 books in the final sample. So one thing you'll notice here is that if we're trying to figure out what needs books satisfy by looking at the users, uh, each user is sort of sampling from this universe of books. Each user is sampling, you know, producing a choice set. We're in this kind of crazy location where uh, places are sort of part of statistical space where the number of samples, N, right, the number of users is actually sort of terrifyingly near the number of characters, the number of sort of test cases, the number of books. Um, usually, the sort of old school statistical inference um, would have many, many users and a small number of choices, maybe five or six, um, out of which you might say, okay, look, some people are AB types, some people are CD types. Here we have um, a much harder task because there are almost as many books as there are choices. There is almost as many books as there are users. So here's another way to see it. The most tagged book the book we have the most preference information on is a book, and this is an old data set, so it's um, maybe 15 years old now, uh, is a book called The Lovely Bones. It's a very sentimental novel by uh, the writer Alice Siebold. So Alice Siebold, uh, The Lovely Bones is, um, it's, you know, Howard Bloom is turning in his grave. Lovely Bones is a novel uh, narrated by a 14-year-old girl who has been horribly uh, raped and murdered. And so she's writing this book. Um, from heaven. She's looking down from heaven and watching her family over the course of the novel adjust to her loss or you know, to having lost her. So this is the most popular book in our data set. It's the most tagged book and it only has 803 users. Uh, so we only know, even this is the most common book, but only 803 users actually share this. So if we go back to the previous slide, we think about the previous slide, we only have less than 1% of the users have uh, this book is an overlapping book. Um, here's another one. This is the second most tagged book in our data set. It's Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, 604 users, or sorry, uh, 640 users. Uh, the next one um, is Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood by Rebecca Wells. This is a uh, one of the Oprah's book club selections, 554 users. Um, in the end, in our data set, it's this extraordinarily sparse system uh, we only have 435 books that have more than 100 people who ever touched them or interacted with them in our data. Um, about uh, 10,000 books have more than 10. The overwhelming majority of books have only two. So if we're trying to find common patterns, we're going to have to use uh, rather sophisticated statistical techniques to even find similarities. Most users, for example, the vast majority of users have no books in common. So, you know, you might say the, the original, you, know, you might have thought, ah, okay, I'm going to try and classify, you know, people who read kind of trashy literature, and many of us are, I confess myself. Um, so the first thought you might be like, oh, you know, there's like, there's the people who like really love Dan Brown, 
right? So we're going to look, that's one choice pattern is the people who like Dan Brown. Unfortunately, we only have 640 users, less than 1% less than of all users even have registered Dan Brown or this particular Dan Brown book as a book they like, right? So how are we going to do this? How are we going to sort of back out a, um, a palette of needs? How are we going to back out these larger patterns? The answer, it turns out, this was a statistical technique uh, invented back in 2005. It's called topic modeling. Um, so here's how topic modeling works. What I'm going to do is describe to you now a particular story um, that is associated with the statistical model. I'll tell you the story, and then we'll talk a little bit about how a statistical model could actually recover that story. So here's what we're going to do. We're told, this is kind of the, 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 the myth of topic modeling. So topic modeling says, look, for every reader, and here's our reader, you know, sort of cozying up to this blank uh, book, as far as I can tell, reading his, you know, drinking his cup of coffee. Um, for every reader, we have a set of that reader's visible reading practices. So that reader's reading practice for us is going to be visible in the bookcrossing.com website uh, data. We know this reader possesses or reads sort of values in an experiential way a particular set of books, like maybe there's He's got two, three, four books that he's registered on the, the bookcrossing.com website. Um, we're going to understand that visible reading practice as responding to an underlying, a hidden set of particular, let's call it a hidden set of needs that that reader has. And we might say, okay, you know, like here's our palette metaphorically. He's got this palette of psychological needs. Um, each color in this palette, and it's called a topic, each color in this, pal in this palette is a distribution over the 48,000 books. So we number them, let's say, right? Um, you know, there's uh, need pattern one, need pattern two, three, and four, up to 10 in this case. Each need pattern is a distribution over books that favor some books over others. So, for example, need palette one may be tilted more towards um, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, John Grisham's The Firm, um, some of, you know, uh, Michael Crichton's Sphere, right? Um, a different pattern, like, you know, pattern number two, uh, palette of need number two, uh, might be more tilted towards romance novels or self-help. So... Um, the reader has uh, potentially some, you know, some set of needs drawn from this palette. Um, each reader's needs, however, are not, each reader doesn't have all 10 needs. Each reader, in fact, um, picks a small number of colors that will satisfy him or her. So let's say, for example, this particular reader, our, our gentleman here in the, in the, in the gray shirt, uh, may have uh, his reading practices are driven in particular by pattern two and, let's say, pattern nine. So that's the story of topic modeling. It says, okay, what we're going to do is make sense of each reader's visible practice, right? So the particular ISBNs, the books that this, that person likes. Um, it's uh, it's uh, going to understand those as being drawn from a palette of needs. The magic of topic modeling, this is the real magical part that has occupied computer scientists for many years. Uh, the magic of topic modeling is given just the list of readers and the particular books each reader likes, so literally a spreadsheet where each row of the spreadsheet corresponds to a reader and each column right, is a book that they've read. Um, topic modeling is able to back infer the palette of needs, so it's actually going to come up with a distribution 10 in this case, so I've arbitrarily chosen in this lecture to model the readers as having needs drawn from a limited palette of 10 needs. Um, each reader is going to have um, a small subset of those needs that are then driving the reading that they're doing. So we run this through, we take the data, we run this through what's called a topic model. Uh, I won't show you the details of this. It's, uh, there's a chunk of code that you can do. What I want you to pay attention to instead is just the output of this, right? So um, out the other side is going to be, um, for every reader, a, uh, a list of their needs. So it'll be actually kind of a, a short list, right? So reader, the particular example here, this reader will have, let's say, 50% need two and 50% need nine. Uh, so each reader, we, we back infer the needs they have. And at the same time, we actually back infer what the underlying needs are, meaning what the distribution over books is. So now I'm going to show you a couple samples from the output of the statistical inference process, and I'll show you in particular the palette of needs, the different colors that come out from the analysis. So um, here's uh, the first, or the first one we'll look at, it's topic zero. 
So the palette of needs, this topic model, each need is, we call it a topic. I'll probably switch back and forth between those terms. What I'm listing here are the titles of the books that are most common in this particular need. So um, you'll see books like, uh, the first one here is Dawn. Uh, the next one is The Other Amanda, uh, Living Dangerously. I'll show you some of the, the covers. So these are romance novels. Um, also sitting in this, in this particular need here is, um, this book is by a woman called Irma Bombeck. If life is a bowl of cherries, what am I doing in the pits? Uh, so in addition to these two romance novels, uh, these are just samples, in addition to things like these first two romance novels, you also get books like this. This is a humor book. Um, I'll read you the, the quote on the back, uh, the blurb on the back of Irma's book. Um, the enchanting lady of laughter has done it again, this time taking a hilarious swipe at husbands, honeymoons, tennis elbow, marriage, lettuce, the national anthem, and a host of other domestic dilemmas. You can get a sense already that uh, this is a book that's not only necessarily satisfying a psychological need, but a particularly socially situated psychological need. Um, it's not just uh, romance novels and the you know comedy of suburban uh, life, but also sitting in here as well is um, this book. It's a book called Secrets of the Morning by V.C. Andrews. Um, it looks to a certain extent like a romance novel, meaning a, a novel about you know men and women falling in love, but uh, it's actually quite a dark one. Um, it described, it's sort of... Uh, genres described by Wikipedia as gothic horror and family saga. It's a romance novel in part, but really it's actually a multi-generational uh, story about uh, uh, abuse uh, and violence. Um, I have to come up with a name for this, for this, this first um, need pattern that the topic model extracts, and I had to give it a name. I called it the affect of others need. Uh, it's a, a, a set of books, the, what these books all have in common, it's these, the books have in common the desire to account for, model, talk about uh, emotions that people have and emotions that people have in relationships with others. That's the best uh, phrase I could come up with it. Um, these are just some of the top ranked books in the, in the particular palette here, in this particular need. Um, it goes on and on and on. So, in fact, it contains all 57,000 books, or sorry, 48,000 books in the data set. Most of them, are, however, are really low ranked. Um, so I'll just, these are the top now 20 of them, or top 40. You can see not only do we have what you might think of as trashy uh, things, right? The other Amanda Harlequin, Living Dangerously, you know, Novel 55. Uh, not only, um, you know, these kind of self-help humor books, not only the gothic horror ones, but if you kind of look in here, you can see some of the top-ranked books. If you are sampling from this need, if you have, according to this model, this need, um, you also, for example, have a 1% chance of drawing uh, The Bell Jar, Sylvia Plath's great first novel. Uh, you have a 1.13% uh, chance of sampling Brideshead Revisited, a book that might actually even make it onto Harold Bloom's list of high-class novels that might even impress John Waters. So this is our first example of a, a pattern of behavior, a pattern of selecting particular books uh, that the algorithm surfaces in this large-scale behavioral data set. Um, Here's a second uh, example from the palette of needs. This is topic two. Again, the numbers are arbitrary. Um, uh, I gave this, uh, I, I named this, uh, this particular need pattern wisdom literature. So it includes uh, books like this. These might think of these as self-help books. Uh, uh, Harold Kushner's When Bad Things Happen to Good People, The Dance of Anger, A Woman's Guide to Changing Patterns of Intimate Relationships. Um, the fact that it's self-help might make this feel a bit gendered. Um, it's not only books associated with women's self-help. Uh, it includes uh, Robert Bly, the poet Robert Bly's book, Iron John, a classic of depth psychology uh, to understand the masculine psyche. Uh, it includes also novels, so it's not just self-help. It includes novels like this one here, Mariette and Ecstasy. Um, this is a novel that was classy enough, uh, sort of high class enough to make it into the New York Times book review. Uh, it has um, an affectual quality, like uh, some of the ones that fall into the first category um, that we called uh, The Affect of Others, but it actually, instead of being a romance novel, it's a novel much more about spiritual development. Interestingly enough, another book that shows up high in this particular need is Zora Neale Hurston's final book, Seraph on the Suwannee. Uh, this is a really um, uh, interesting book. It's a 1948 novel. 
Um, Joyner Erson is, a, is one of the great African-American writers. This was her last published novel, and it's actually quite a controversial one. Uh, it was written after her publisher uh, rejected two previous novels she had written. Uh, both of those rejected novels were black characters, so Hearst's last book, she said, fine, I'm going to write a novel about white people. Uh, so this is, in fact, her only book that focuses on, uh, a, the, whose plot focuses on white characters. Uh, it's a book largely um, rejected by academic scholars, certainly scholars interested in African-American literature, um, uh, who have uh, sort of treated this as kind of a... a, a sort of commercial faint that, that Hurston either did or was forced to do. But lo and behold, it appears quite high in this particular need or use pattern. So those are our first two affective others and wisdom literature. Here's, a, here's another one. This is an interesting one. Um, very high on this list and depending upon, um, you know, the, your, your social circles, this, you may have seen these books before. Um, Coming up very high on this pile of needs is a series of Tom Clancy-like novels called the Left Behind series. Uh, this is Tribulation Force, uh, the second volume in the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. Uh, LaHaye and Jenkins' series is in many ways like kind of blockbuster film like The Sum of All Fears, uh, Hunt for Red October, but with a twist because, in fact, uh, the Left Behind series plays out a violent action-packed drama that takes place in the late 90s and then into the early 2000s, uh, where um, the uh, prophecies of the book of Revelations in the Christian New Testament comes true, right? So the Left Behind series is what you might think of as Christian apocalyptic fiction. It has some of the traits of um, the, the standard blockbusters that you're familiar with, right? Like, oh no, the nuclear weapon's gonna explode, but in a explicitly religious and in fact evangelical Christian context. Uh, sitting also in this same need pattern, so people who are sampling from this need are not only potentially drawing from a, uh, the Left Behind series, but also a certain kind of self-help book, a distinct kind of self-help book from the one we saw in wisdom literature. In this case, a book like this one by Rick Warren or Pastor Rick Warren called The Purpose Driven Life. I'll just read you a little bit of the blurb. Uh, Before you were born, God already planned your life. God longs for you to discover the life he uniquely created you to live here on earth and forever in eternity. So this is kind of, a, kind of like Aristotelian Christianity that you see kind of emerging uh, in this book pattern here. Uh, another example, uh, Who Moved My Cheese, um, a, a self-help book. Don't sweat the small stuff. Um, and it's all small stuff, simple ways to keep the little things from taking over your life. Um, all these books are grouping together. So what we're seeing is the algorithm is pulling out the fact, not necessarily that everybody who buys Tribulation Force, Volume 2 of Left Behind, is also purchasing Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Some of these patterns may be being detected at second or even third order. I had to give this need a name. I had to give this, this usage pattern a name. I called it uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, it's not just, of course, the, um, uh, the lion Christianity, the... Uh, the soldiering forth Christianity that you see in the Left Behind series, but also uh, the maybe softer evangelical Christianity that you might think of as associated with the Sermon on the Mount, right? Don't sweat the small stuff is like a paraphrase of a chunk of, you know, a sermon by Christ, you might imagine, like, you know, sufficient unto the days or the troubles thereof. Um, these are three palettes, uh, three needs. I've chosen them in particular because they're sort of unusual. They may, may perhaps be unexpected. Um, other needs that the other usage patterns, um, sort of the taxonomy of fulfilled desires that the topic model surfaces in the users we find, um, some of them are perhaps more familiar. So uh, topic seven uh, pulls up. Uh, this is essentially the John Grisham, Michael Crichton, Dan Brown, uh, action-packed adventure novels. I had to give it a shorthand name. I called it the Da Vinci Need. Uh, da Vinci, referring to Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, which is one of the top, um, uh, most common books that are pulled out of that need. Now, when I say, of course, most common, uh, Da Vinci is one of the most common, but it's, you know, only 640 people actually even sampled that need. Um, another need, uh, I called it the Oprah's Book Club, or Oprah for short. So this is um, a pattern of book consumption uh, characterized in part by uh, books that were advertised and sold uh, through Oprah Winfrey, the, the uh, famous American pop culture figure, uh, 
who had a daytime television show, Oprah Winfrey's Book Club, uh, uh, where she would you know, choose a book for everyone to read together and then, in fact, bring the author on to the show. So sitting in Oprah's Book Club books here, um, uh, Alice Sebold's Lovely Bones, which I mentioned earlier, uh, The Secret Life of Bees, I'll just read you the blurb, a remarkable novel about divine female power, a story that women will share and pass on to their daughters for years to come. So these are two more uh, familiar patterns, perhaps. Um, here's another one. This one I found particularly interesting. This is um, topic eight. Um, one of the things in topic eight in this particular need usage pattern uh, is the fact that a lot of books you might think of as sort of, you know, maybe Howard Bloom would have respect for these books and John Waters. Uh, sitting in this one, if you are sampling from this pattern, includes books like James Joyce's Dubliners, uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hess. Uh, in addition to these, uh, you might think of as high or maybe middle brow in the case of Herman Hess. Uh, novels also sitting in here are uh, The Essential Calvin and Hobbes and sort of mildly liberal left-wing uh, humor books um, at the time, uh, the Senator Al Franken's uh, book, uh, Lies and the Lying Liars, we tell them, uh, sort of parody book uh, attacking, in this case, the right wing. Uh, so this is, I think, an interesting um, uh, 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 set here, interesting in part because it mixes really explicitly in some of the most common samples uh, books that we might consider highbrow and lowbrow, complicating, I think, the idea that, um, you know, books are either trash, um, they're books like Eat, Pray, Love, or they're sort of high-class um, objet d'art. Um, I had to come up with a name for this. I called it, um, intuitively, I, I called it the Young Seekers Pattern, um, books that I imagined, and we'll have some demographic data to partially back up my earlier intuition, um, uh, books that are uh, purchased by people who are sort of trying to make sense of the world through, um, uh, in part, through high art books by um, sort of writers in the canon like James Joyce. So this is a sample of the 10 needs. I won't go through all of them. You'll see some of the other needs, uh, some of the other patterns of, of usage that are coming up um, in a moment. But let me flip from looking at the palette here so what I've done so far is talk about the uh, patterns that the topic model extracts and look in particular at the users because the, the two things that this topic model does, first of all, comes up with these 10 patterns. And again, I set the number 10 by hand. You tell the thing, find me 10, it will find you 10. You say, find me 20, it will find you 20. But it also uh, back infers or attempts to back infer uh, for each reader, the particular pattern they're drawing from. So our data, unfortunately, we don't have gender data, which is too bad. We do have age data and location data. I've restricted this entire analysis to the United States, um, but uh, here's one. This is a 23-year-old. We know this person lives in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, this 23-year-old is 58% young seeker pattern. So the books that this person is registered on Book Crossing 58% uh, of them are drawn from the, the Young Seeker pattern, 28% are drawn from the Da Vinci pattern, 12% from the Oprah pattern. So that's our 23-year-old. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is a 57-year-old person from Independence, Missouri. 51% uh, from this Affect of Others pattern, which I've shown up here just to remind you. Uh, affect of Others mixing some kind of romance novel things along with a certain kind of humor. Uh, along with a uh, something not quite romance, more darker, more gothic. 7% um, wisdom literature, 23% uh, onward Christian soldiers, so books drawn from this pattern here, and 12% da Vinci. So now you've seen all the different pieces of the statistical inference that's happened. The topic model has back inferred patterns of need and uh, also then attributed them uh, in a fractional fashion, in a weighted fashion to each of the users. All right. So what to do with this? So first of all, we can spend, and we could spend a great deal of time sort of savoring the complexities of what's going on here. What this statistical model has enabled us to do is surface uh, highly implicit patterns that we would not have been able to spot directly, right? It's showing us that there's something hanging together among users, even if they don't share any of the things in common. So for example, it's extraordinarily likely that this 23-year-old from Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the 57-year-old from Independence, Missouri, these two people have no books in common on book crossing. That's almost a statistical certainty. 
At the same time, what this topic model has done is by coarse graining the list of 48,000 books, it's found, it's like, actually, there's evidence here that there's something that these two people have in common. And in particular, what they have in common is a small or you know, weak preference, in the case of the person from Independence, a weak preference for a certain kind of book that we were calling the Da Vinci pattern, right? The, the books like the Da Vinci Code, books like John Grisham, like Michael Crichton, uh, like Michael Patterson. So, uh, looking at this, one of the things you might say to yourself is, okay, you look at this for long and you say, well, that's interesting, this 23-year-old this is 58% young seeker, 28% da Vinci. You start to wonder, okay, not only is it interesting to decompose any particular user, but it's also interesting to look at the extent to which different needs within a reader might become linked. So, in particular, we're going to do... Um, the, we're going to do this mathematical calculation that you've learned to do, which is measuring what we call linkage. So you've already learned how to measure linkage between two words in a text. Now we're going to look at the linkage between two needs. So mathematically, what we do is look at the probability of seeing a user with simultaneously need A and need B, and divide that by the probability of seeing a user with need A, multiplied by the probability of seeing a user with need B. So if this ratio is high, it means that need A and need B are sort of predictively co-located in a user's psyche, right? Um, if the linkage between A and B is large, it means that, oh, if a user has need A, it suggests that it's more, than, more likely than chance that they also have need B. So, um, in the case of the linkage you previously computed between the word democracy and capitalism in a text, here we have 10 needs in the end. So I've actually represented this as a network. Each of the circles here, each of the nodes in the network corresponds to one of the needs that we've isolated using the topic model. And then the edges, the things connecting those two nodes, shows the strength of that linkage. So um, if the edge is thick, right, the thicker the edge, the stronger the edge, the stronger the linkage um, signal is. Uh, I've also scaled the circles here. So the larger the circle is, the more common the need is. So let me now do the reveal. What you're interested in, of course, is what these particular circles refer to. So sitting right in the center here, nine and seven, these are the two needs that I called the Oprah need and the Da Vinci need, um, nine and seven. Um, sitting down here, this is the affect of others need down there. So one thing you can see, of course, is that affect of others is coupled strongly to da Vinci, although not as strongly as da Vinci is coupled to Oprah. What else is sitting here? Um, okay, there's this other node. I didn't show you the books. It's actually another romance novel node. I called it the literally just Nora Roberts node, Nora Roberts being a, a, um, one of the most prolific publishers of romance novels. Um, Sitting over here, it's the wisdom literature need that you encountered, linked to Oprah, it turns out. Uh, up here is that onward Christian soldier's need, the left behind kind of Christian apocalyptic fiction, but also this kind of softer, purpose-driven life, uh, God's self-help for you um, book usage pattern. Uh, what else is sitting here? That's the young seekers, so the people also reading Dubliners. Uh, people also reading, um, uh, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, it turns out. Um, I haven't shown you, I didn't go through all of the topics. There's um, a pattern of book consumption, which I called uh, Child World. So early Harry Potter books, Charlotte's Web, books like Charlotte's Web, the Goosebumps series. Uh, sitting up here is a usage pattern I called Fantasy Worlds. It includes books like Interview with a Vampire, uh, books from the Lord of the Rings series, Dune, Ender's Game, books from the Wheel of Time series. And then the final one is uh, something I call Pulp Mystery. So a lot of the books sitting in this palette of needs strongly weighted towards mystery books like Who Killed, you know, uh, Jessica Fletcher or whatever. Um, how do we understand this network? I mean, it's, you know, fun to sort of look at it. Uh, many pieces here. The first thing I'll draw your attention to actually is not just the fact that Oprah the Oprah pattern and the Da Vinci pattern are the most common needs sitting in our data set, but also they're, they're most strongly linked. So if you're somebody who consumes books out of the Oprah pattern, it's highly predictive that you're also consuming books out of the Da Vinci pattern. So I kind of call this sitting in the middle here, I call this like the normie corridor, right? So sitting in the center of this network are two extraordinarily common needs 
one associated with books um, that are similar to, or in many cases equal to, uh, books selected by Oprah Winfrey's book club. Not all of them, I should say. So Cormac McCarthy was on Oprah's book club. Cormac McCarthy is not in here. Um, there's a strong link between that and this very sort of uh, famous chunk of books like John Grisham, like Michael Crichton, like Michael Patterson, uh, like Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code sitting in the center there. So if you like normal books like the Da Vinci Code, you also like normal books like Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. So that's the first thing that, that shows up here. Um, there's a lot of other things that I think are actually surprising. The more time you spend with this, and it helps, of course, if you have the full list of the, you know, the top 20 or 30 books associated with each of these neat patterns. One thing that strikes me right away, actually, is take a look at uh, topic one here and topic zero. So Affect of Others includes a lot of romance novels. Um, uh, this one here, the Nora Roberts pattern, I called it, is actually almost entirely romance novels. Interestingly enough, even though we might think of the Da Vinci Code, um, John Grisham, Michael Crichton as sort of gendered male, right? This is like, ah, manly books, like, you know, people disarming nuclear bombs. Actually, funnily enough, sitting over here, the uh, people who like books in this pattern here are actually predictive of them liking uh, romance novels. Um, if you had to, if you were to ask me to make a guess, I would have made, I would have thought the connection between the romance novel consumption pattern and the Oprah's book club consumption pattern was much stronger. In fact, people who like, you know, you know uh, submarines blowing up also like romance novels. Um, sitting over here on this end of the normie corridor, uh, over here is much strongly, well, much more strongly connected to the wisdom literature pattern, to the young seekers pattern, and to the onward Christian soldiers pattern. So, uh, you know, what is this linkage network telling us over and above uh, the fascination of seeing each of the particular uh, you know, palette of 10 needs? One thing I think it's saying is that the division here between the consumption of popular literature or in many cases, the reuse of sort of canonical literature for popular needs. The split here is not between, oh, um, you know, books about action and adventure versus books about love and romance, but something more like a separation between, on the left-hand side here, books associated with spiritual concerns, uh, how to live a good life, um, the, the meaning of one's experiences on the left-hand side versus a more action um, thrill experience given by the stuff on the left-hand side. So the, uh, the experience, the thrill of romance is predictive of enjoying the thrill of, um, you know, can we solve the murder in the, uh, you know, in the basement of the Louvre. Whereas on the left-hand side, um, even though something like Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, the Lovely Bones, seems like it might be about love and romance and therefore connected to, um, you know, the, the Harlequin romance series. Actually much more connected, much more predictive of something like the Young Seekers pattern. Uh, many things in here, we do have, as I mentioned, we do have a little bit of demographic data that might help validate some of the intuitions we have about the social positions. Um, what I've done here, these are all of the, these are the 10 needs. Um, I've, uh, what I'm showing you is the median age and then the middle 50% range of ages for people strongly weighted on each of these topics. So um, what do you see here? Well, uh, topic four, I call this child world. So this is a pattern of literature consumption that involves what we might think of children's literature. So yeah, Charlotte's Web, great book, the Goosebumps series. Um, validating our intuition there, you know, the median age is 19. Okay, maybe a little old for Goosebumps. Uh, but down to 14, between 14 and 33. Uh, the Young Seekers pattern, topic eight, uh, the median age is actually 33, so it's in their early 30s, spread 26 to 44, similar in fact to topic three, which is this fantasy worlds uh, range here, median age of 32, between early 20s and, and early 40s. Uh, many, many things here, but let me just bring us back to the deeper question we have. Um, what we've looked at so far is stuff on the left-hand side of the culture industry. What we've studied is the pattern of uh, consumption, the kinds of predictive patterns of consumption sitting in the individual reader's choices. And so emphasize, we haven't been able to get too deep into it, emphasize that this choice pattern is made, of course, up of the literature that's available, right? It's impossible for somebody to read a book that does not exist. 
Although, as Richard Jean So's talk said, it's possible now in the modern user-generated content era for people to write books they wished exist. That's something that we ended up seeing, of course, uh, after our data finish, unfortunately, we see happening in a book like Fifty Shades of Grey. But in general, this, this, this sort of taxonomy of fulfilled desire is the subject, it's the intersection of psychological needs of the reader, their social position, and of course their invisible interactions with the community of other readers. So what we've done so far is examine that network of, of patterns that emerge from the left-hand side. Let's look now to complete our investigation. Let's look now at the right-hand side. So uh, we've looked first at the individual reader's choice patterns, the, uh, what those patterns are and how those patterns might link together. Now let's go to the other side and look at the kinds of marketing choices the publishing industry makes. So what we're going to do here is look not at the needs satisfied by V.C. Andrews' book. Like If you remember, this is this gothic romance. Uh, that's associated with the um, affects of others pattern. But we're going to go look at the back of the book um, and look at the blurb itself. So our second, the second part of answering our question here, having first diagnosed and produced a taxonomy of implicit needs that are being satisfied, we're now going to look at how the books that are satisfying those needs are presented to the consumer, right? So we're going to look at this the woman on the cover of this book is terrifying. It's going to haunt your dreams if you look too closely. We're going to look in the back here and we now have access because of um, someone who very kindly uh, produced a database of these blurbs sitting on the back. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to examine the types of marketing patterns that exist on the backs of these books? We're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to do a top, we're going to run the topic model, model algorithm. But instead of taking readers and the choices they make, we're going to take blurbs on the back of the book. So each book now is going to be seen as drawing from a palette of blurb needs, or sort of blurb text. Right? So we'll do the same thing, actually, as we did in the case of the readers. We're going to choose, we're going to say, O topic model. Um, we have a list of 48,000 blurbs. For each blurb, we have the list of words in the blurb. So we just have all the words that appear in that particular blurb. And we want the topic model to tell us, okay, those words are being drawn from a palette of 10 marketing strategies, let's say. So um, this is a classic image that you'll see when someone teaches you topic modeling. Um, we have some text here, right? So this is the text. In this case, our text will be blurbs. And all the words in this text are being drawn from some subset of topics or palette, right? This is some set of uh, sort of blurb strategies that the uh, publisher is, is making available. Uh, in the same fashion, each blurb will be decomposed into a small set of, you know, some subset of these 10 possible patterns. The topic model is magical because not only will it figure out what each blurb's patterns are drawing from, but will also tell you what each pattern consists in. So when we do that, in the case of when we ran the topic model on the reader preferences, we had a set of needs. Each need was a list of books or a distribution over books. In the case of the topic model, each blurb, each uh, sorry, each blurb pattern is going to be a list of words. So I'm going to put that full list up there. Don't panic, right? So this is just to kind of give you a sense of the output of the algorithm. Uh, this is the list for each of these topics here, each of these marketing patterns, the list of the most common words. Uh, let me zoom in. I'll just magnify this. This is. Um, one of the possible uh, sort of marketing strategies, this is topic three, again, the numbering is arbitrary, it's topic three. So if the blurb is drawing from topic three, words you might see are like words like world, and earth, and evil, time, magic. Right? Uh, here's another topic, this is topic seven. Uh, so if the blurb is drawing from the marketing strategy seven, it's including words like life, and book, woman. Right? So um, just as an example, um, these word lists can be sometimes difficult to interpret. One thing you can do is, of course, go to each blurb one by one and say, okay, this particular blurb, it's decomposed into which subset of the patterns. So here's an example. This is um, a book called, it just comes in our data. I didn't buy this. Uh, not that it's not a great book, I'm sure. It's called A Witch Alone, The Essential Guide for the Solo Practitioner of the Magical Arts uh, by Marion Green. So it turns out this is a book uh, that is weighted, in fact, highly on topic three and topic seven. And I'll just show you the blurb on the back. So what the topic model has done is taken this blurb and decomposed it and said, ah, this blurb is going to be 
a combination actually turns out 41% topic 3 and 41% topic 7. So I'll just I'll read you the blurb on the back here. Uh, this blurb carries on the tradition of the solo village witch emphasizing white rather than black magic. It is a practical manual of instruction for those who choose the solo path of study and particularly stresses the importance of being in tune with nature. As there are approximately 13 moons each year, this book is divided into 13 parts. Each section is aimed at lasting from the new moon to the dark to make the student fully aware of the changing power in the tides of the sea and the tides of the self. The moon-long sections deal with a variety of traditional spelling mistake arts, skills, and mental exercises, which enables the inspiring witch to discover the inner work of magic inside him or herself. So uh, what's happened here? The topic model has done two things magically and simultaneously. It's uh, found a set of 10 patterns that can now decompose every single blurb. This particular blurb is mostly pattern three and pattern seven. So um, if we look into this a little bit closer, um, it's 41% this topic three, the world, earth, evil, time, magic, power pattern. It's 41% the life, book, women, world, people, work, God, lives, personal, so on, so on, spiritual pattern. And it's actually 18% this uh, third pattern, topic five, uh, book, guide, information, color, easy, recipes, includes, addition, food, step, full, illustrations, and so on. So if I were to give names to these topics, um, I might call topic three the sort of magical world fantasy topic. Topic seven, the, you know, women's spirituality, human uh, time, meaning, wisdom pattern. And 18%, uh, topic five, this kind of practical, manual, useful recipe pattern. So that's the marketing side. That's the sort of pattern of uh, the, the, the sort of trio, in this case, the triplet, the weighted triplet of marketing patterns the publisher has chosen to put on the back of the book. Okay? So that's the pattern sitting on the back of the book. But we can also just as well ask, what is the pattern of need the book is answering to? So we can also say not just what... Uh, what is sort of sitting on the back of the book in terms of the palette the publisher has painted, but what is the what kind of use is this being book being put to by people in our data set? Uh, it turns out, so you can ask this as well, people who are reading this book, 55% of this sort of book's pattern is sitting in the wisdom literature, 9% in the Oprah pattern, and then the rest of that book is sort of spread over the other ones. But this book is strongly sitting in the wisdom literature category. So we now have two pieces in place, right? We have the two halves of our original research question about the intersection of the reader's needs and the publisher's provision and marketing. Uh, we can see on the right-hand side, we have a decomposition of every book into a pattern of marketing strategies. And of course, at the same time, for every book, we also have uh, the decomposition into the needs it might satisfy, right? So we can sort of cross over, we can go across this divide and ask or attempt to ask and answer the question we began with, which is what is the relationship between the needs a book is satisfying and the rhetoric of the blurb on the back, right? This, in fact, we can uh, operationalize this as the linkage between need and rhetoric. So formally, we can do a computation here. We look at, take a book now, right? So this book has some probability that it satisfies a particular need, let's say need A, and a probability that it simultaneously satisfies, or on the back, the publisher has put blurb B on, right? So we can compute for every need and blurb the linkage between them, right? If uh, the linkage between need A and blurb B is strong, it means that when you see a book that's satisfying need A, it's likely to have on the back, right, the publisher's blurb, uh, in this case type B. That linkage is strong. That means that there's a coupling between the use made of the book, at least the use we see being made of the book by the consumer, not a great word, but the use being made of the book by this, people who possess the book and at least share it on Goodreads, and the marketing strategy sitting on the other side. So I'm going to show you now, this is going to be, a, don't you know, blow your mind here, I'm going to show you now a network, and this network is going to show you the strength of the linkage, not from one need to the other, so we already saw that one, right? We saw the linkage that said, ah, you know, if you're the kind of person who has the Oprah need, you probably have the Da Vinci need. If you're the kind of person who has the Da Vinci need, you might be the kind of person who likes romance novels, the kind of person who has the Oprah need, you might like, you know, um, Onward Christian Soldiers pattern. In this case, here we go, 
We're going to show you the linkage between blurb and need. So the green nodes here are the needs. The pink nodes are the marketing patterns, the blurb patterns, the things sitting on the back, right? So I'm only showing you in this case the linkage across the mode, right? The linkage between, <coughs> excuse me, the linkage between on the one side, the, uh, the use and the other side, the marketing. I'm not showing the need to need linkage. You already saw that. Nor am I showing you, in fact, the, the blurb to blurb linkage, just because we don't have enough time. Uh, instead, what I'm showing you is the extent to which the marketing is matching or failing to match the need. So let's take a look here. Uh, if you look in the top uh, right corner, so if you look here at blur pattern three and palette of need and uh, need pattern three, the numbers are arbitrary. The fact that these numbers are the same is actually meaningless, it turns out. Uh, but here's blur pattern three. It's actually topic three. Uh, this is the world, evil, earth, time, magic, so on. Uh, pattern of word usage. You've actually seen that. That was one of the neat, that was one of the blur patterns sitting on the back of the witch's book. It turns out actually that even though it was that witch's book was sitting in the uh, the wisdom literature need mostly, but in fact, most of the time, nearly all the time that you see blur pattern three is when it's sitting on the back of a book that's part of the fantasy world's need. So this is a case here where the publisher's marketing, the marketing of the culture industry, right, the industrial side is actually matching pretty closely the use side, right? The publisher in some sense knows that there is such a use as the fantasy world's use, and it can see that, and the, on the other hand, there's you know, people in the world when they make use of this, if they ha there's a coherent need associated with that same book pattern. So this is the case where things are actually kind of lining up pretty well, but in other cases, you can see it's much more ambiguous. So take a look, for example, at need five. That's actually, it turns out, the Onward Christian Soldier's Need. So that's the Left Behind series and some of the, um, uh, you know, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff self-help, right? So you can see the Onward Christian Soldier's Need is sitting there. That's green node five. This is the Young Seeker's Need. That's, uh, that's node eight, right? So the Young Seeker's Need, books like Dubliners, for example, but also including books like uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, notice that these two needs share blur patterns. So Armor Christian Soldier's need and Young Seeker's need, both quite predictive linked to blur pattern five, which is this blur pattern here, it's topic five, book guide, information, color, recipes, edition, illustrations. This is a blur pattern associated with, I would say, kind of the use value, the kind of practical use value of a book. And you'll notice that, in fact, the publishing industry has linked, uses this marketing pattern here, both on books that ended up being consumed in the Onward Christian Soldiers Need pattern and the Young Seekers pattern. Right? Uh, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers and Young Seekers also shares this pattern here, this blur, this blur pattern seven, uh, life, book, women, world, people, work, gods. This is actually a need that you've seen, or sorry, a blur pattern you've seen before it was on the back of the witch's book again. So uh, we get kind of two things going on here. We can see two um, situations, right? If we ask, what's the relationship between the choice patterns of the readers and the marketing of the culture industry? In some cases, actually, it's very tight, right? Um, there's a, the publishers know there's a kind of reader that likes fantasy books, and it has on the, sitting on the back of that book is the, you know, a blurb that really kind of signals that. There's a tight linkage between marketing and use. Uh, another example, I, didn't, I, uh, I only told you one of the, the cases of this tight linkage, the fantasy world's linkage, but in other cases, actually, there's a similar sort of strong, uh, strong link, and that one of them is the Oprah case. So books in that Oprah need very tightly linked to a certain blurb style. The marketing and the Oprah, uh, the, the, the marketing of this book, uh, of books in this category, sort of matches the needs of the people, right? There's a use pattern and a marketing pattern that overlap. Right? So that's one case. Uh, in other cases, I think much more interesting cases are places where people are making use of books that go against the marketing pattern, or at least are sitting somewhat obliquely to the marketing pattern. The example I gave you is Armored Christian Soldiers and Young Seekers. So these are use patterns that people have. These are decisions that people are making in terms of the books they consume. Um, but that, those patterns are only weakly linked to marketing blurbs. Right? The publishers, you might say, haven't figured this out. Um, maybe it's not they haven't figured it out. But somehow, there's now a disjunction 
between marketing and use. And so if you wanted to give this a kind of classy name, I think of this as sort of theory of partial surveillance, right? The, the, the generation, the stuff generated by the publishing industry and the patterns of consumption of the actual sort of the democratic individual are uh, in some ways not quite across purposes, but mixed, they're commingled. So this is at least our provisional answer. And as we sort of emphasized, every project in the humanities analytics needs to be answering a scholarly question. This is our first uh, sort of attempt at answering that scholarly question. So let me just review. This has been a, uh, a sort of a rapid tour. We focused much more on the large scale big picture questions. We've talked a little bit about the uh, underlying statistical inference patterns, but really our goal here has been to show how to take, how you might take some more advanced statistical tools and use them to answer profound questions. Uh, we began with a, a framework, a sort of theoretical framework to understand the relationship between the individual who makes use of books and the publishing industry who provides the choices that those readers can make. I introduce you to bookcrossing.com. This was our data set that enabled us to look uh, more closely at the kinds of choice patterns that readers have. Uh, we, I presented you with a kind of problem, we call this the long tail of taste or the long tail of needs problem, which is that even though we know 100,000 users and all the books they've chosen, they've chosen to read, it's actually non-trivial at that, at that step to figure out overall patterns. You can't simply say, oh, show me all the readers who like uh, Da Vinci Code. That'll tell us something about what people are doing with literature. Because if we did that, we would only get, we'd get less than 1% of all the users. We'd miss most people. So in order to kind of conquer this statistical inference problem, I introduced you uh, to something called a topic model. And a, uh, a topic model is a way of producing a model of sort of underlying, a sort of coarse-grained underlying sort of set of needs that the reader in this case might have that then produce the visible reading practices that we can see on the surface. Right? So this is our way of going beyond, trying to um, sort of attack the challenge of the long tail where most books are consumed only once or twice to find sort of implicit underlying patterns in what readers are choosing to do. Topic model does two things. It's sort of a magical, uh, it's a magical object. Uh, topic model does two things. It tells us the kinds of needs that readers have, but it also tells us what those needs are, which is quite remarkable. Uh, I gave you a tour through some of the patterns of consumption that we saw. Um, those patterns, in some cases, they were a bit, you know, would have made sense. Like, yes, congratulations. You have discovered that people who like Tom Clancy novels probably like John Grisham novels. And there's kind of an action adventure, Da Vinci Code, uh, uh, way that people use literature. But other use patterns are much more complicated. So there was, for example, the affect of others pattern. There was the wisdom literature pattern, the onward Christian soldiers pattern, and so forth. So I gave you a tour through some of the things that that topic model enabled us to do. Um, I then gave you an example of how we could use uh, a tool that you're familiar with, this linkage method, uh, to examine how, not just what those needs are, but how those needs might be linked together in any particular user. So for example, uh, it so turns out that if you have a need that's satisfied by the Oprah kind of book, the Oprah book club style of book, it also probably is predictive of you being a kind of normie person who also likes, you know, John Grisham novels. But that linkage network actually tells us things that might be counterintuitive. So you might have thought just sort of stereotypically, well, Oprah's Book Club sort of famously is mostly uh, associated with women reading books, uh, women's literature. But in fact, actually, it may be more a need that uh, answers to a sort of spiritual need. If you look at the needs that co-occur with the Oprah needs, they include needs like satisfied by armored Christian soldiers and sort of Sermon on the Mount literature or wisdom literature or the Young Seekers pattern we talked about. Conversely, um, the sort of John Grisham need, that Da Vinci Code need, is actually associated with the need for kind of thrilling experiences presented by romance. So it complicates a sort of what you might have come up, you know, sort of come up with at a first pass kind of gendered story. Something more here, it's much more of a psychological use story than it is necessarily about a, um, uh, you know, just, oh, you know, sort of these, this kind of person likes this. Um, <clears throat> that was our choice side. Sitting on the other side of this equation is not the choices the readers make, but the choices the industry makes when they come to design and market these books. 
So we took the same statistical tool, this topic modeling tool, and applied it now not to readers' choices, but to blurb, uh, blurb writers' choices, you might say, how the blurbs themselves are constructed. And the final step of our analysis was to look at the conjunction, the intersection of the readers' needs and the marketers' blurbing practices. And what came out the other side was, and you know, to, let's say this is a preliminary account of what's going on, um, and uh, that in some cases these blurb pattern needs are overlapping with the uses made of the books. Uh, in the case of Fantasy Worlds, it turns out, in the case of the Oprah Book Club books. But more interestingly, perhaps, there are other kinds of needs that are working against the, uh, the marketer's understanding of what literature can and can't do.